Welcome everyone, my name is Rob, and today we are going to be going over the first book in the Harvard Classic series, The Autobiography of Ben Franklin. I'm going to pour a little coffee real quick, and then we're going to dive on into it. Like you're probably wondering, in a 50-volume series of all the people you could choose from, why choose Ben Franklin? I will give you my guess later in the video, but uh, first let's dive into his life real quick. The autobiography of Ben Franklin is a remarkable journey in the life of a statesman, an entrepreneur, and an inventor. The first part of the autobiography is written in 1771 while in England. Now this predates the American Revolution, which I kind of thought was ironic because I didn't realize how much he had done in his life before the American Revolution started. He was already very successful before that. The second portion of his autobiography is written in 1784 near Paris, when he was living in Paris at the time. And then the third and last portion of his autobiography is written in 1787, uh, after he's back home, after the war, and everything like that. The ironic thing is, he only records his history up until 1757. So, it's missing a lot of the years during the American Revolution and stuff like that. I was not aware of that whenever I first started reading. So that was something that kind of, you know, stuck out to me that everything he did before 1757 was still a lot. But then he went on to accomplish so much more. So the autobiography starts out with basically Benjamin Franklin writing to his son, William. And he goes through the history of his family, he starts talking about his uncles and stuff like that. He kind of dives into what their jobs were, what his dad's occupation is. So he kind of dives down into the genealogy of the Franklins. Now, Josiah Franklin's father was married twice, and he had 17 children, and Franklin was the at the end of the 17 children. So you got the hand-me-down of the hand-me-down at this point. There's no money left for anybody to go to college at that point. Franklin only goes to school until about 10 years old, and then he works with his dad at the candle shop for a while, and then he gets he becomes a bonded apprentice to his brother around, around 12, um, James. James was his brother. And like brothers, they really didn't get along that well, especially at that age, you know. And when you got your little brother there trying to, like, learn and you're having to teach your little brother stuff, um, it, it didn't go too well. And I think James kind of beat on him a little bit and stuff like that. And Franklin, you know, finally got fed up and he jetted out one day. He said, I ain't going to take it anymore. He went down to Philadelphia. Now, what's cool about somebody so young going to some someplace so new, and Franklin really describes this entire scene, this area, you get a feel that you're traveling from Boston to Philadelphia down these little back rivers and, you know, with the, the, the moon and, and the light. And like, he really just puts a lot of detail into the story getting there. I like that because it kind of sets up the time of where you're at. So after getting work at a local print shop around there, he gets approached by Governor Keith who basically wants to kind of help fund Benjamin Franklin in getting his own print print shop. Uh, so he writes this letter and stuff like that, and Benjamin Franklin goes back, he goes back to Boston, talks to his dad, and is like, hey, look, I got this opportunity, basically, that this governor's done signed off on. He's going to give me credit, and I'm going to get all this stuff, and you know, I'm going to do my own print shop. What do you think? His dad's like, you know, when things like that happen in life, son, it's kind of too good to be true. I, I would, I would, I would advise against it. Franklin goes back, and what does he do? He says, "Uh, yeah, let's 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 do it. What what do I need to do?" So, the Governor Keith tells him, "Well, hey, look, you need you know you need your type. You need all this stuff to open your print shop. So, how about you get on a boat and go to England? I'll give you this letter of credit. You can get all the stuff, bring it back, and you know get set up." So Franklin gets on the boat, and he's waiting for this letter to show up, and he's talking to the captain, whoever's over the boat, and he's like, hey, did, did Governor Keith's letters get on? And he's like, yeah, they're they're at the bottom. We're not going to get them out now, but whenever we get to England, you'll have a chance to go through and get your letter out. So they make it all the way over to England, and Benjamin Franklin is going through these letters, and there's no letter from Governor Keith. So he's talking to some of the people on the boat, and one of the older guys, I forget his name, he laughs, and he's like, yeah, that's... That's Governor Keith for you. He doesn't always hold up his end of the promise. And so Franklin, he's kind of distraught, taken back. There, there's no cell phone at this point. Like, you can call mommy and daddy and be like, hey, I messed up. Can you help me out? No, Franklin, he has to go get a job. And he says, he has this phrase in the book that I, it really stuck out to me. He says, in speaking about Governor Keith, he wished to please everybody. And having little to give, he gave expectations. And I really like that because there's a lot of times... You know, especially with my kids, 
I don't have the resource of time at the moment, so I will give them an expectation. Like, I can't go outside with you today, but tomorrow we'll go outside and we'll do X, Y, Z, whatever you're wanting to do. And a lot of times, it doesn't happen. I gave the expectation, but I didn't think about tomorrow that I had something else to do. So how many times do you, because you don't have the resource right now to give, you give an expectation. And uh, yeah, Franklin learned that the hard way. Uh, and that was a pretty big lesson. That was a whole year out of his life. Now, he did the best with that year. He he basically got with a print shop out uh, in, in England and dove deeper into the trade of what he was wanting to do. So about a year later, he saved up enough money and he uh, met a friend and he basically sailed back to the colonies. Once he was back in the colonies, he worked for a print shop for a little bit longer and it would eventually open his own. He eventually goes on to find the Philadelphia Library, the fire department. He helps this guy open up a hospital by, you know, basically showing him how to 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 set up funding and stuff like that. He will go on to write the Poor Richard's Almanac. And then he starts to dive deep down the self-education rabbit hole. He starts learning Latin again, French, Spanish, Italian. And in my feeble mind, he eventually becomes like a self-help guru, uh, kind of like the Tim Ferriss of the 1700s, you know? He was the embodiment of a self-made man at this point. And he created a list of virtues that he wanted to live by, how to better his life and be more productive and be, and be more prosperous and, and be a benefit to society. And this is one of the passages from that portion. It was about this time that I conceived the bold and arduous project of arriving at moral perfection. So he's trying to get, he's trying to he's trying to live a perfect life. And he says, I wish to live without committing any fault at any time. I would conquer all that either natural inclination, custom, or company might lead me into. As I knew, or thought I knew, what was right and wrong, I did not see why I might not always do the one and avoid the other. But I soon found I had undertaken a task of more difficulty than I had imagined. While my care was employed in guarding against one fault, I was often surprised by another. Habit took the advantage of inattention. Inclination was sometimes too strong for reason. I concluded at length that there that the mere speculative conviction that it was our interest to be completely virtuous was not sufficient to prevent our slipping, and that the contrary habits must be broken and good ones acquired and established before we can have a dependence on a steady, uniform rectitude of conduct. For this purpose, I therefore contrived the following method. So basically, he created 13 virtues, and he was going to focus on one of them for one week. And then after 13 weeks, he was hoping to basically perfect himself. I'm not going to dive deep into each one of the virtues, but I will just read them out to you real quick. They were temperance, silence, order, resolution, frugality, industry, sincerity, justice, moderation, cleanliness, tranquility, chastity, and humility. And under humility, he has imitate Jesus and Socrates. I love that because it's the two philosophical world of the Greeks and the philosophy combining with the, the religious world of Jesus and the, the Hebrew teachings. And I think that's a cool thing, you know, imit imitate the good in life. Now, out of these 13, I think Franklin would have probably struggled with silence the most. Uh, that's just my humble opinion. Uh, he seemed to write a lot. I mean, he's writing an autobiography about himself. He was constantly in the public view. He was constantly writing letters. I don't see ben Benjamin Franklin really being that quiet guy at the party. He was witty. He owned a newspaper. He was constantly putting out information. So to me, that's just my little humble humble opinion. I think I think he would have kind of struggled with silence. The Society of Free and Easy was created for for this project. And basically, it was a group of people that would get together and they would try to live out these virtues in in this time frame. You know, that one week in it was kind of like a little accountability group, kind of helping everybody to kind of get a little bit better in life. And I think starting the series off with Franklin is, is also a great example that if you weren't given a great education early in life, you can still acquire one on your own with good discipline and good habits, which I feel is honestly the purpose of the Harvard Classic series. No one's really going to force you to read it. No, no one's going to you know, be checking in, hey, did you read your assignments today? You got to have the daily discipline to go through a, a large series like that and 
constantly read a few pages every day, read a couple chapters every day, and just eventually get through them. And for this reason, in my opinion, I think that's why Mr. Elliot, the president of Harvard at the time, put Benjamin Franklin first. He's somebody that you can somewhat relate to because he didn't come from very, you know, a rich background. He really taught himself how to make it through life. Putting Franklin here was kind of a a way to say, hey, look, it's, it's been done before. And if you have the discipline and a goal to make it happen, then you can do it. So some of the vocabulary that I thought was kind of, you know, unique in this book, um, I, I'll, I just chose five of them. They're short. It was Scrivener, which is someone employed to make written copies of documents. I never really thought about it, but I guess like, you know, you had to hire somebody to be a copy machine back in the day. So if you needed 10 of these letters to go out to different places, Somebody had to sit there and just hand copy each of them out. Um, a milliner was someone who makes and sells hats. A fortnight is 14 days or two weeks. I always hear that term, but it just always goes right over my head. I, I never really knew what it was. So it's it's 14 days or two weeks uh, time frame. That's a fortnight. Lampoon is to ridicule with satire. And non-cupative, non-cupative is declared orally as opposed to writing, especially by someone morally wounded. So if there's somebody on the battlefield and they're saying, you know, where they want their money to go to or, you know, tell their wife this, um, that's a non-cupative statement. Some of the books that he mentioned reading and possibly shaped his upbringing were The Pilgrim's Progress, uh, Plutarch's Lives, On Human Understanding by Locke, The Art of Thinking by Messiah du Potoreal, and Memorable Things of Socrates by Xenophon. Uh, he had a few writings himself, and actually actually he had a lot. A few mentioned in the book are The Nature and Necessity of Paper Money, uh, Poor Richard's Almanac, and Proposals Relating to the Education of the Youth in Pennsylvania. I'll look some of these up. You can read, still read through them, and uh, it's actually pretty cool to see that. Some quotes that I really liked from, from this book, uh, Franklin was, he, was, uh, he had some witty, witty little sayings. Uh, he says, so convenient a thing is to be a reasonable creature, since it enables one to find or make a reason for everything one has in mind to do. Uh, there was this one instance where he was a vegetarian. He, he didn't eat meat or anything like that. And he saw that these fish, once they cut them open, had little smaller fish inside. And he was like, well, if you can eat your own kind, then surely I can eat meat. And that was his reasoning behind starting to eat some meat. My favorite is he wished to please everybody and having little to give, he gave expectations. That's talking about Governor Keith. Uh, he that must thrive must ask his wife. I think when you first get married, you do not appreciate that statement enough. And then as you go and you grow through your relationships with your spouse, uh, you do realize and you can you can flip that. He that must thrive must ask his wife or her husband. Like you, you really need to have everybody on board if you want to accomplish what you want to get done. It's hard for an empty sack to stand upright. Uh, that's that's a good one too, because if you don't have morals, if you don't have virtues, you will fall. There's no questioning it. Uh, you you got to really believe in what you stand for. And if that sack is empty and, and you, you, you don't have what it takes to keep that sack up, uh, yeah, it's just going to crumple down. You're not going to have anything. Uh, a few good lessons from the book. Now, Franklin's he has some really good lessons, and he kind of spoke in a he kind of tells the story in a parable type way. And there's so many lessons in his life that I think you can pull out. And one man kind of saw this and really wanted Franklin to 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 finish his autobiography and at least get it out there. And this was a a letter from Benjamin Vaughn pushing Franklin to publish his autobiography and finish it. And it's kind of a, deals a lot with the youth. He said, "Influence upon the private character late in life." is not only an influence late in life, but a weak influence. It is in youth that we plan our chief habits and prejudices. It is in youth that we take our party as to a profession, pursuit, and matrimony. In youth, therefore, the turn is given. In youth, the education, even of the next generation, is given. In youth, the private and public character is determined, and the term of life extending, but from you to age. Life ought to begin well from the youth, and more especially, before we take our party as to our principal objects. What he's saying is educating the youth is more than just preparing somebody for a job. It's educating them in how to pick a spouse, how to pick an occupation, 
how to live a virtuous life, how to gain the morals that you're going to need to be a good citizen. It's preparing them for a good life and really building that foundation. Uh, he also has a good passage in here on female education. I think this was important, especially having two girls about to be a third here, actually this month. He mentions a story of partnering with a man in a print shop and funding him to basically get him started. The man dies not too long after getting the print shop up and going, and Franklin's kind of his partner. So the man's wife takes over, and she's so good at the accounting portion of it, keeping the books, making sure everything's, you know, I's are dotted, T's are crossed, that Franklin, he's kind of impressed. And he kind of has this passage in a book that I think is really unique. He says, I mentioned this affair chiefly for the sake of recommending that, that branch of education for our young females. And in that, he's talking about like the accounting, the, the, the bookkeeping type stuff. As likely to be of more use to them and their children in the case of widowhood than their music or dancing. By preserving them from losses, by Im imposition of crazy men, and enabling them to continue, perhaps a profitable mercant mercantile house with established correspondence till a son is grown up fit to undertake and to go on with it to the lasting advantage and enriching of the family. That's kind of revolutionary for that time period. I know it doesn't sound like, you know, that big of a deal nowadays, but back then that was a pretty, you know, that was a pretty big statement to make. There's also a, a story in there where this man spoke out in opposition against Franklin becoming the clerk of the General Assembly. So they were voting and he was saying that, yeah, let's choose somebody. We don't really want Franklin. So Franklin would eventually get it, and he, he was voted back in. But instead of Franklin feeling slighted or, or that he should go and be this guy's opponent, Franklin was like, okay, well, how can I make this guy, you know, get him on my side for the next time? So he found out this guy had a pretty, you know, rare book in his, his collection. So Franklin basically asked him, hey, do you mind if I borrow that book? Uh, keep it for a couple of days. I'm going to read through it, and I'll give it back to you. The guy was kind of taken back, and he's like, yeah, I mean, yeah, I, I, I guess so. You know, go ahead and take the book or whatever after Franklin reads it he brings it back and they meet up and they, they talk and it's it kind of breaks that ice you know and he hands the book back and uh everything was kind of good after that Franklin thanked him and they kind of you know discussed the contents of the book and then Franklin has a, a a great little quip here he says the man was no longer an opponent of his public life he that has once done you a kindness will be more ready to do you another than he whom you yourself have obliged basically what he's saying here is that if, you, if somebody else is willing to help you, most of the time in the future, they're going to be willing to help you again if you kindle that relationship. If you go out and help somebody, it's harder to expect that person to help you back because a lot of times they won't. I thought that was kind of a good little good little note in there. There's also this funny one about this itinerant preacher, Mr. Whitfield. Upon one of his arrivals from England at Boston, he wrote to me that he should come soon to Philadelphia, but knew nowhere where he could lodge when there. My answer was, you know my house. If you can make shift with its scanty accommodations, you will be most heartily welcome. He replied that if I make that kind of offer for Christ's sake, I should not miss of a reward. And I returned, don't let me be mistaken. It was not for Christ's sake, but for your sake. One of our common acquaintances remarked that, Knowing it to be the custom of the saints, when they receive any favor, to shift the burden of the obligation from off their own shoulders and place it in heaven, I have contrived to fix it on earth. I love that because there is a lot of times where, you know, we go around and be like, hey, you know, my mom would really, you know, she's really going to appreciate you doing this. And it's like, I don't know your mom. I know you. I'm doing it for you. I'm not doing it for your mom. So I think that's funny that he actually corrected the itinerant preacher. One common theme I find throughout this book is this idea of crowdfunding. If the citizens wanted something, you know, like a paved street or, or a library or something like that, Franklin would go, he'd get together, and then they would discuss it. And then it'd be this, you know, well, well let's come up with, you know, six pence from everybody, and then we'll cobblestone the street. It was kind of this crowdfunding source. And then he would put ads in the newspaper to kind of push it. And uh, I, I really thought it was pretty cool. It seemed like a way to get the people who wanted the cobblestone to pay for the cobblestone, the people who wanted the library to pay for the library, um, instead of tax dollars just going all over the place. And the, the idea had to be good enough where people actually wanted to put that money in. So Franklin would die in 1790 at the age of 84 after living through, in, in my humble opinion, one of the most interesting times in human existence. He's a perfect example of what you can, can accomplish if you do put these virtues into practice and you manage your time correctly. He was an industrious, he was inquisitive, he was always seeking self-improvement, and I honestly feel he, he really did contribute positively to the world. I mean, from the lightning rod, a lot of stuff that's not even in the book, if you go look him up, it's just he did a lot of stuff. And again, these are just some of the amazing lessons in this book. You're going to pull out some different ones 
ones that you kind of relate to more and stuff like that. Uh, if you want to learn more about Benjamin Franklin, there's a great biography by Walter Isaacson. I've read it before and it's, it's really, really good. With that being said, I truly hope you enjoyed this review of the first book in the Harvard Classic series, The Autobiography of Benjamin Franklin. I'm looking forward to diving down to John Woolman's journal next. Another great Quaker living in that same little area right there, so that's going to be fun. I, I really think you're going to enjoy his his story and what he stood for. These videos are sponsored by my coffee company, so if you do want to help support the channel or anything like that, uh, please think about buying some coffee. I, I roast it all myself, package it, and I'll be flinging it out to you. So I will link my website in the description below. If you want to check it out, check it out. If not, no worries. I completely understand. So hit me up in the comments. I would really love to hear your thoughts on Ben Franklin. Yeah, with that being said, just keep reading, drink some amazing coffee, keep your nose in the books, and let's try to live a better life. Love y'all. You were drinking wine and you were speaking Portuguese. I was making lots of noise busking on the city streets. I came back from Brooklyn, but you didn't come back for me.